Hi, Juju from the RBA. This video is our second on monetary policy transmission. In the last video, we mainly looked at how changes in interest rates affect aggregate demand. We learned that this works through four channels, the savings and investment channel, the cash flow channel, the asset prices and wealth channel, and the exchange rate channel. In this video, we're going to explore how changes in aggregate demand flow through to other indicators of Australia's economic performance, such as employment and inflation. We'll also talk about some other important considerations for monetary policy transmission. Let's continue with our example from the previous video of a decrease in interest rates. This would occur if the RBA eased monetary policy, say by reducing the target for the cash rate. A decrease in interest rates leads to an increase in aggregate demand through higher spending on consumption and business and housing investment, and also through higher net exports. Let's draw this on a demand and supply diagram. To meet this increase in aggregate demand, businesses will have to increase production to supply these goods and services. The point where aggregate demand and aggregate supply meet is called economic activity and is measured by GDP. However, it can take some time for aggregate supply to respond to a change in aggregate demand. When demand is higher than supply, we say that there is excess demand. Remember, aggregate supply measures how many outputs can be produced from a given amount of inputs. Inputs are things like labour and capital. How efficiently these inputs are turned into outputs is called productivity. See our video on aggregate demand and aggregate supply for a refresher on these concepts. The reason aggregate supply can take a while to respond to an increase in aggregate demand is that more workers, equipment or infrastructure could be required to increase production. This takes time to organise. For instance, ordering equipment and waiting for delivery can take time. Constructing buildings or infrastructure can take quite a long time, even years for some projects. Also, businesses may not be able to meet the excess demand from their existing workforce. They'll then have to go through the process of hiring and training new workers. As a result, employment will increase. If many businesses are looking for workers, they might be unable to find enough suitable candidates for the jobs that they need to fill. So, they may have to raise wage the wages they offer to attract them. They may also have to give their existing employees higher pay rises to make sure that they don't look elsewhere for a better offer. This can lead to faster growth in wages. Faster wages growth increases the cost of production for businesses by more than otherwise. Businesses may wish to pass on some of this cost to households, other businesses and governments that demand their goods and services by raising their prices. This will increase inflation. This type of inflation is called cost push inflation. So that's one example of transmission from a change in aggregate demand to inflation. In addition, if there's excess demand for a good or service, those wanting to purchase them might be willing to pay more to have them now, rather than waiting for more supply to become available over time. This will also pull up prices and therefore inflation. This is another chain of transmission from demand to inflation. We call this demand pull inflation. We can think of many examples of this happening. Say a family wants to visit their favourite restaurant, which is very popular. A recent decrease in interest rates means their mortgage repayments have fallen, and so they have some more disposable income they to spend. So they decide to go. But many others have also decided to book the restaurant as well. When the family rings the book, they find out they can't get a booking for a month and hang up, disappointed. What can the restaurant do? Well, they could increase the number of sittings they do a night to allow more people to go. However, the restaurant only has so many tables, their kitchen is only so big, and there's only so much time in an evening. It would also take time to expand the size of the restaurant, and they would probably have to close temporarily. The restaurant might reason that if so many people want to come and they can't fit them all in, they could raise their prices a bit to increase profits. Sure, the increase in prices might deter some customers, but many will be willing to pay extra because the restaurant is so popular. The restaurant might assess that they can still operate at full capacity, even with higher prices, so they increase them. If this is happening for goods and services across the economy, then lots of prices will increase and this can pull up inflation. 
There is a third chain of transmission from monetary policy to inflation, inflation expectations. Inflation expectations work a bit differently to cost push and demand pull inflation. Instead of affecting inflation through aggregate demand and employment, they transmit directly from monetary policy to inflation. Inflation expectations measure how much households and businesses expect prices to rise in the future. This can affect their behaviour when they make economic decisions, like when they buy goods and services, what type of investments they make, and how much income or revenue they want to earn. For instance, if households expect inflation to increase, they might ask their employer for a higher pay rise than otherwise. They will want to maintain the purchasing power of their disposable income, that is, how many goods and services they can buy with their income. If businesses expect inflation to increase, then they might decide to increase their prices by more than otherwise. This could be because they expect to have to pay their workers higher wages to account for the higher inflation, or because they expect other costs associated with production to increase. It could also be to maintain the purchasing power of their profits, which after all is the business's income. You may notice that households and businesses adjust their behaviour based on what they expect to happen to inflation in the future. However, their behaviour, asking for larger wage increases and increasing their prices by more, will itself lead to higher inflation. This means that inflation expectations can be self-fulfilling. That is, what households and businesses expect to happen to inflation tends to influence what actually does happen to inflation. So how do households and businesses form their expectations for inflation? Among other things, they are guided by what inflation is currently. This means that inflation expectations are quite persistent. That is, they tend to, tend to change slowly over time because inflation today carries forward to expectations for future inflation. Monetary policy also has a role to play. When the RBA adjusts monetary policy, the resulting changes in interest rates will flow through the economy and affect inflation. Households and businesses are aware of this. Because monetary policy takes some time to influence the economy, which we'll talk more about soon, when the RBA changes monetary policy, this also affects households and businesses' assessment of what inflation might be in the future. In fact, by having an inflation target, the RBA can anchor inflation expectations. When the RBA commits to set monetary policy to achieve inflation of 2 to 3% per year on average over time, it does this in part to influence households and businesses' expectations for inflation. Because the RBA's inflation target is credible, meaning that households and businesses trust the RBA to achieve this target, they can have more confidence that inflation will be consistent with the target and adjust their expectations for inflation to reflect this. With inflation expectations anchored to the RBA's target, businesses and households can then make better decisions about their investment and expenditure because they face less uncertainty about the future state of the economy. To finish, there are some important things you need to keep in mind when thinking about monetary policy transmission. One is that monetary policy transmission doesn't happen instantly. Changes in monetary policy take time to work their way through the economy. In other words, there is a lag between changes in monetary policy and changes in economic activity, employment and inflation. In part, this is because not all interest rates adjust immediately after a change in monetary policy. For example, we've discussed how fixed rates do not change once they are set, until they expire. But it's also because households and businesses take a while to adjust their behaviour following a change in monetary policy. Some estimates suggest that it takes between one and two years for monetary policy to have its maximum effect. The other thing is that the exact effect of a change in monetary policy on economic performance is uncertain and can vary over time. We call this the pass-through of monetary policy. This is because the structure of the economy and how households and businesses behave can vary over time. For example, how much banks decide to adjust their deposit and lending rates in response to a change in monetary policy, how many households and businesses are borrowing at a fixed versus a variable interest rate, or how much households are likely to spend out of an increase in their disposable income can often vary. 
Economists often try to estimate how much they think a change in monetary policy will affect economic performance and how long they expect this might take based on what has happened in the past. If you'd like to learn more about these estimates, there's a link to an RBA bulletin article in the description. So that's all for this video. You know almost everything you need to about monetary policy. In the next and final video in our monetary policy series, we'll look at Australia's inflation target and how this guides the Reserve Bank Board's monetary policy decisions. See you next time.